when you're living your plan B, success is someone else's success. You're living inherently based on someone else's expectation of you. And therefore, I think you gotta have a dream. The school of greatness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Please welcome Lewis Howes. We were talking beforehand that that most people have dreams, but they don't go for them. Something you were saying. You have been going for your dreams your entire life, but why do you think most people have them and never go for their dreams? Why do you feel like a limited few actually do? I think it comes down to being inspired by different stories. I think you have to see it to believe it, right? Mm -hmm. That's one. Um, you really need someone to follow and be inspired by. Mm. I know this sounds strange, but when I was younger, I didn't see anyone who really looked like me or who I think was this hybrid of different cultures and then also even different personalities. Like yeah. I knew I was analytical, but I was also very creative. And so like I would be one of those people who would be doing math homework, but I'd be watching like Beyonce and Britney documentaries mm -hmm. because I loved that entertainment side and that creative side as well. So I think that's like a big chunk of it. And then at the end of the day, society has conditioned us a little bit to have fear of doing things differently. Mm -hmm. And we need to learn to listen to ourselves, to be very, very confident in our identities, right? Not care about what other people think of us, right. to not be scared of failure, to really push through those things. And a lot of it requires you to just start. Mm -hmm. And you can start in the smallest way, whether it's, you know, we were talking about it, sports, you know, for me it was dance. It taught me the tools of life. And I think we forget that sometimes it's the smallest things that we do that teach us those lessons for these great things that we do. Yeah. Class Pass would not exist if I didn't learn how to dance in a small basement when I was five. Really? You know? Yeah, because so many of the lessons of how do you have discipline, how do you show up on time, how do you be prepared for something, how do you work through something when it you can't do the step, those are the same mentalities that you need when you're an entrepreneur who wants to go and build something big. What's more important in your mind? Is it the belief in yourself? Is it being clear in your identity? Or is it learning how to master goal setting? Great question. Those are all very different things and all important. But I think ultimately it's the belief. It's the belief in yourself, but I'm going to like change that a little to the why too. I think it's the belief in what you're doing ultimately. It is the passion in your reason for partaking in anything that you do that's going to push you through all those challenges, right? It's the energy that gets people to join you. Yes. in the battle. It's the energy that gets you to keep going when you lose part of the battle. And that to me is the crux of it, is caring enough about what that impact is. And it's not just about you, right? Mm -hmm. If it's just about you, it doesn't resonate. You, you'll quit. And if it's something about, you know, just about being famous or having money, it's that's not worthy enough. And you'll your soul will feel that. Mm -hmm. And you'll know that it's not worth to keep fighting. So to keep fighting, you just need that deep, deep why. So it's a belief in what you're creating and why you're doing it. Absolutely. Not just a belief that I want this for myself, but there's a deeper meaning behind it. 100%. And so that's the first, is that one of the first things is having that belief in what I'm doing first? Yeah. I mean, I think you need to have a calling, right? Yes. And I, you know, in my book, I talk about that as the first chapter because to me, if you don't know what you're driving towards, we can't even get into what's holding right. you back. Right. You don't know where you're going, mm -hmm. right? And so if you know where you want to go, your true north, yeah, there's going to be a lot of things in the way, but you will fight your way through them. I think you. I think I read that you started class pass around 27, is that right, or 20? When I was 20, I think I was, yeah, 27 years 27. old. 27, okay, yeah. so from, let's say, call it 18 to 27, did you know what your calling was? So for me, it was all always about dance. Like my mm -hmm. life revolved around this artistic expression that I actually found when I was three years old. Mm -hmm. I know it feels crazy. I know a lot of people don't always find their calling that early. But for some reason, when I was really young, my parents put me in like dance classes and I'd perform at like family functions. And I know this sounds weird because everyone's like, yeah, like that was like a little thing that you did on the side. But I think when I would perform and I would realize that I was impacting other people mm -hmm. and their hearts and they could feel what I was feeling, I started to realize what the impact of the sense of service could be, right? The sense of I through was- Through dance. Through dance. I felt like as a human being, I could impact other people, right? It wasn't, oh, do I want someone to tell me I'm a good dancer or did I do the steps right? It literally was this amazing environment for me to say, 
I impacted people. I made them feel something. And I think once you know that we have the ability, it's a power, right? Mm -hmm. As like a human being to feel like I have the ability to touch other people. Mm -hmm. And I discovered that at such a young age that to me, I always kept striving for that feeling mm. in my life and to whatever I did, like that just trumped everything else. So it was more like striving for the, the feeling of connection and inspiration, but you used it through different mechanisms. It was dance for a while, but then it was other thing, you know, class pass eventually. Yeah. Now, why not, you know, why, if you knew you wanted to do dance, why go to MIT and not go to dance school? and pursue dance as the main thing, the main calling. So I wish that, you know, I wasn't burdened to society's expectations too, <laughs> but... So you mean parents yeah, and cultural expectations absolutely. that you gotta go to the best school and you gotta be this? I mean, and... my parents, you know, immigrated to America in uh -huh. the 70s, okay? Like, let's be honest, they sacrificed their entire life for me and my sister. I also felt a sense of duty to mm -hmm. them, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, they had literally, I mean, you, you see it when you're younger, just how hard they were working, two, like, night shifts, like, two shifts just to put food on the table. When you're around that, you're not just going to go and jump off a cliff and be like, bye, you know? And yeah. I know they did it all for my education. Mm -hmm. So I knew I had to do something with that. Mm -hmm. And I don't regret it. I think, you know, I, I look back and I feel like I, I had to learn to get off of that at some point. And that's the trick. Like, it wasn't about for me just jumping off without having a plan. I think what they did is they set me up to have the tools and the foundation to be able to succeed in my life. Even though I didn't maybe see it at the time and I wanted to just go and do my own thing, you know, being at a corporate job or working at a place like Bain gave me an amazing network. It gave me so many great mm -hmm. parts of this journey and like the skill set that I would need to succeed, even though I maybe wanted to go and just just dance. Right. That all being said, too, is it's interesting, you know, and, and I think this is still like a topic and something that I'm still trying to figure out is that we as especially as like immigrants, you know, or children of immigrants, we don't know how to necessarily like put our creative side first because we were taught to sort of put the business side and the part that's like whether it's the doctor side or lawyer side mm -hmm. first. And so we don't fully know how to believe in our creative selves and say mm -hmm. like, oh, this is OK to do because we've not seen many paths of people that look like us also right. succeeding in that in that world yet. So hopefully that's changing now, but that's yeah. another whole part of it. But um, yeah, for me, ultimately, it was really my parents and their and their, you know, guidance that I was listening to. But also, I think the most important thing is I spent my time wisely. So I never had to give up dancing. Right. Mm -hmm. And I do believe kept doing it on the side, I kept doing it on the side, like even at MIT, I was that person who the second I would finish like my homework, I was dancing, I was like helping wow. to put on a show. My life revolved around dance shows, wow. dance performance, dance rehearsals. If I wasn't doing my homework, I was, I was dancing. And everyone knew that. There was only like wow. two things that were important in my life. And I think I was, I've always really been clear about that. And I think that's okay to be very, very clear on your priorities. So you go after that. And I didn't let anything else bother me. And mm. I, didn't, I missed family things. I missed friends' birthdays. But I was very clear on what my priorities were. And I knew I had to fight to dance my whole life. And ultimately, and you know, I think people don't always realize this, Class Pass came out of that because I wanted to take that fight for everyone else. Because people were fighting to have fitness in their life, right? Mm. Movement in their life. And I knew I had to solve that problem because I saw what my fight looked like. And I wanted to make it easier for other people. Interesting. Interesting. So for those... I guess after MIT until you launched was what five years then something like that where you were doing uh, six years yeah after you MIT I had I had, two, and... I had two jobs in between that I worked at for three okay. years each yeah now did you feel like those five six years was your calling you were doing your calling no not at all okay. I mean I was split in two I was faking who I was right really? yeah I mean I was showing up to work wearing like I don't even know like business suits and all of that acting like I loved what I did, but because once again, I was supposed to do that and I got this great job, like how could I not appreciate it, right? Mm -hmm. That's that's sort of how you feel. But I would leave every night and go to dance rehearsal. And um, you know, I think one of my favorite stories is uh, I got my first bad review, like first time in my life in my third year at Bain. And, and I say bad, obviously that's like. It's like a B plus. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, as opposed to an A plus, exactly. I got a B plus, that's like. My dream to get a B plus. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Indian parents were like right, 99. Right. Yeah. Why, you, why isn't it 100? That's yeah, sort yeah. of the mentality we were raised in. <laughs> but, um, 
you know, I had skipped a big client meeting to go to a dance performance. Ooh. And, um, you know, I always think back to that. Like, I was trying to make both things work. And they were so different. It's not like anyone I was at work with was doing anything similar to what I was doing on right, the side. Right. And so I had this huge performance. And I, you know, I thought my boss was okay with me skipping it. I wasn't, like, a big part of it. And then it comes up in this review. And she was like, are you serious about being here? And I was, and actually, my first reaction, and this is what I always go back to, was I'm going to prove to her I belong here and how great I am. And you're probably working 50, 60 hour weeks More at least. Yeah, you're probably like showing up first and leaving late anyway. Yeah, absolutely. And so it's like to feel like you didn't do enough. Wow. Um, and so that's my first reaction, right? And so I spend like a little bit of time thinking through like how I'm going to prove that I'm amazing and I deserve to be like number one, 99% again, or 100%. And then I realized I don't even really want to be doing it. Like she was actually right. Do you really want to be here? Yeah. I don't want to be there. You know, and so back to your question, I really, when I was going through those journeys, I mean, I didn't know, you know, I was doing what was right, mm -hmm. trying to live my passion through a side hustle, right? Which I feel like most people know about. And I, but I was two people and it's kind of really hard when you're living your life once again, just not feeling like you fit in mm -hmm. either. And so then I made this first big leap in my life that I think was like the first decision where I was off track was to go to corporate America and work at in the music industry, which it was a great job. Like it by no means is that a bad job. Most of my friends were just going off to like HBS or, you know, and doing something really crazy with their lives or staying on to be consultants. So I felt like I was taking a step back from that finally, like from that professional career everyone was trying to tell me to do. And I went and built my dance company. That was actually my first startup is I started a dance company on the side. And I got off of work every day at five, six o'clock. I knew I would, which was something I never had before. And I got to go to dance practice, dance classes, rehearsals, and I knew I would make it. And I think that freedom of having just that time that was predictable for me from mm. the thing I loved became really important. You're such an underachiever. Um, <laughs> You talk about plan A and plan B in the book. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like you were living in plan B then for those years? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I was trying to explore a plan A, you know, but I didn't really, I think I was always compromising. What happens know? when we choose a plan B or C versus going for what we feel like is our calling or what we feel like keeps speaking to us inside, which we think is plan A. Maybe it's yeah. not, but we think it is. What happens to us? spiritually, emotionally, physically, when we're living plan B? I mean, you're not living what you were meant to do and put on this earth for, right? Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, like whatever your dharma is, right? Your calling is, it's, you were meant to be doing something. And honestly, like once I started going for it, and I think this happens to other people as well, the world and your, will guide you through it. The universe mm -hmm. helps you when you're there. And when you keep pushing it away, it, it's actually harder to feel any of the signs. And back to like, a feeling of stuck or whatever anyone might be feeling, when you are in motion in place of going to where you're supposed to, like the world will lift you up, right? The, like the signs of even like when people are like, how did you build a class pass? And, you know, we can talk more about it. Part of it was sometimes I felt like the universe was just opening the right doors for mm. me. You know, I had to walk through and do the work, but I also felt that the things that were meant to happen happened because I knew I was meant to build this company. You were on the right path. Totally. And mm. I was doing what was like set my soul on fire, you know, at that time. And I think, you know, while I was still dancing on the side, all of that, I knew I had to fight this battle for the world, mm -hmm. you know, and that was, you know, what my gift of class pass really was in doing that. Yeah, I think the, the world, or you, the universe really rewards you when you start taking those actions. And maybe it gives you some kind of beginner's luck, or but it should show you signs that, hey, yeah. We're going to reward you at least a little bit to know that you're on the right path. Sometimes it takes it away and it makes you go through the challenges yeah. to see if like, do you really want this that badly? What are you willing to do to overcome Completely the challenge? Agree. But I think you you should start to see that early on. Now, did you feel like, what is I, where does identity play in then when you're living in plan B? Are you truly living in your identity or, and how does that affect your identity? You know, our identities are shaped from such a young age, right? In whoever we're around, the communities we build, all of that. And I think, um, first of all, I think for me, like I go back to the youngest phase of my life where 
I faced a lot of adversity for being Indian mm -hmm. and it's scarring, right? Like it was one of those things for me where I never wanted my American friends to see my Indian side and mm. in front of my Indian friends, you know, I was I was completely, you know, Indian, right? So it was like it was totally two different people. Like split personality almost, Totally. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think that also happens with your plan B, back to that, right? Mm. It's you just start going through your life because you don't know what success looks like anymore, right? Mm. When you're living your plan B, success is someone else's success. You're living inherently based on someone else's expectation of you. And therefore, you don't know what the end is. When you're living your own life, you know where you're going and every part of the journey feels a little bit more like you're achieving something and success is the journey. Mm -hmm. It's not about actually getting to an end point. Right. And right. I think that's the difference. When people always are always like, how are you so happy? And how are you like keep, and I'm like, because every day I feel fulfilled because I am moving closer to something I wanted to do. If I was in a de like a day job that I did not like, I'd want to what? Only want a promotion, right? Mm -hmm. Or only want a salary raise because there was no other way to sort of reward me for how I was feeling. From the daily work of me meaningful work, of being in the right exactly. place. That's why I tell my team a lot. I'm like, listen guys, this is the mission we're on. We're yes. here to serve lives. We're here to help people improve the quality of their life through this content. If that's something you're excited about, awesome. We want to support you in your growth. If it's not something you're excited about, you shouldn't be here. Absolutely. Why are you struggling? Why are you doing something you don't fully feel aligned to? Absolutely. There's and other you, jobs out there. Yeah, and maybe <laughs> maybe you don't like 100% of what you're doing. Yeah. But you should be in alignment towards the mission. Absolutely. And um, otherwise, go find something that you are more in alignment with, with your skills and your you will, And you'll learn more from that and yeah. take it with you, right? Absolutely. At the end of the day, like even for me, like, Working in the music industry felt a little bit off to me, but mm. you know, like I got to meet like Daniel Eck at Spotify, like when Spotify was first being right. created, and me and him hung out. And he, like, I, once again, like when I started Class Pass, people were not entrepreneurs, right? Like we were kind of talking about that early on with podcasts. Like it's one of those things that no one around me was an entrepreneur, but there I got to meet someone like Daniel, who built an enormous, obviously, yeah. company that transformed our lives as well. And I think it brings you the right people when you're even a little bit closer mm -hmm. to it. And so being in the music industry felt a little bit more creative and it felt a little bit more... Closer to your closer, calling. Closer, closer. Yeah, Not yeah. fully there. And, yeah. you know, life is about kind of shooting the darts at, you know, and, and try things. And mm -hmm. sometimes you get closer. I think the, the thing that people mostly get stuck on is they want to like circle around the same thing, but it's okay to go a completely different direction sometimes. I think it is. And I think it's okay in your, if you're in... You know, your 20s when you're just trying different things and you're realizing, okay, this isn't what I want. You can eliminate that. Yeah. Try it for six months or a year. I did so many little odd jobs when I was younger. <laughs> I was a truck driver for three wow. months. I was a bouncer at a nightclub on the weekends. <laughs> I was doing random stuff. Yeah. And I was like, okay, I don't want to be driving a truck I for don't six hours be doing a day. That. I don't want to be here around alcohol night because I don't drink alcohol. Like, so it's, but sometimes you just got to season your life where you got to make money. You yeah. Know? So it's okay. What can I do? One hundred percent. You know, actually, and you bring up a great point. Like I think we forget the importance of money. Like mm -hmm. it is important. Yes. It shouldn't guide our decisions. Meaning, you know, I really believe in this idea that you know you have to make money work for you. You don't work for money. Yeah. What does that, what does that look like? That means that you put a plan together. You know what your budget looks like, and you make your life and plan mm -hmm. for the future work to that. I, you know, was making great money. I had great jobs, right? But I was yeah. making so, six-figure salaries. Yeah, probably, great. Yeah. I mean, I had great jobs. I was so frugal, and the reason I was, and mm -hmm. people didn't realize this. It wasn't just because, like, people are like, "Oh, because you're a Gujarati, which is a type of Indian, which is like <laughs> tends to be cheap." It wasn't because of that. It was because I knew that in the future I wanted to take a leap. I actually, at that point, had no idea I was going to go and try and be an entrepreneur. I didn't know if it was this idea of dance, but because I was so inspired from when I was younger to like impact people, I knew there was going to be a point in my life where I was going to do something and I didn't want money to feel like a constraint mm. because I saw the way it constrained my parents, right? I've seen it in so many of my friends and I'm like, I don't ever want to spend a dollar if it's not giving me something. Like, of course, I need to sleep, I need to eat, I need to get to work. Like, that was what I needed to do, but everything else was... I was able to sort of like, I didn't travel, I didn't go shopping because I was like, I'm saving this to either put on a dance show or take a big leap in my life. Right. And that's what I did. So make your money work for your dreams. Right. And sometimes it's in the future, right? Like I did that for six years. And by the time I got to the point when I wanted to start my company, I sat down with my dad. We went through my entire savings. We put down like a budget of what I was spending my money on. 
And we both realized that I had three years to go after my dreams. And that's amazing, a right? A runway. A runway of three years that's before a, I would be like at dead zero. Yeah, that's I mean, a lot I was. Of time. My apartment was like $800. Yeah, you're living <laughs> frugal on that three years. It's but yeah. fine though. But I mean, I made it work because, you know, the idea of being able to have freedom from money to go after my dreams for three years was incredible, mm-hmm. right? And think about people who also, and this happens all the time, you might start a company, but you need to still make money on the side. That mental distraction is also really hard. When you're building a company, you need to go all in. You need to go all in, especially if it's, you know, it, businesses are different. Like ClassPass is a bit of a different business than other businesses, but... When it was something like ClassPass that I knew could be this transformative, I knew it required 180% of me. Mm -hmm. And if I was sitting there trying to be like, oh, how am I going to make money on the side to just pay my bills? Those few hours of my day, the stress of it, the the also just feeling like once again, I'm living a plan B there, it ends up affecting you, right? Mm -hmm. Going back to identity, when you're in environments that don't make your identity thrive, you end up losing your confidence a little bit. And that is sometimes the worst spiraling effect that happens. And I think I've been always really good about starting myself with either my dance friends or people I really love and I know are going to support me. And I'm very okay with like getting rid of the people who don't serve me and my future. And I think that's a very hard thing to do, but you have to protect yourself in order to be able to create the impact in the world. It's not about being selfish. It's about actually protecting your mission so you can impact other people mm. and give you know greatness to the world absolutely yeah i think a lot of people may seem like that's so extreme to be that frugal for that many years yeah. to work so hard for five six years to save all your money to give yourself a few years of runway but these are decisions people need to make okay do you want to spend all your money and live kind of month to month or totally. have a, a couple months of savings because you're enjoying your life at absolutely the and, and if you are that's great that's like, great totally it's just be just conscious about it know right? what you're doing exactly be very very make it something you consciously do yeah. so once again money is not running you mm. you are running it like yes. you said like that is a great way i know people who live like that and who are very happy exactly i just knew that it's like for me as someone who I, once again, I didn't know if I was going to be an entrepreneur or artist or what. I just knew I was going to have to take a leap. And I felt like I was doing a lot of it because of I needed to have enough money, right? Because that was the biggest thing my parents really wanted for me. It wasn't really this idea of success. I had checked every box for them. I went to a grade school, all that. It was no longer about... You worked a corporate job. Yeah, like it was this, not yeah. about that. It was about having enough money, you know? And I, once again, I didn't know where those three years were going to take me. But I was going to try. And I always knew I had a good, I did have a plan B after that. Right, right, yeah. You can go back and work corporate. Yeah, and, exactly. Yeah, I, I had a plan B. But I knew I wasn't going to think about the plan B until three were years like, were up. Yeah, you were out. Uh, in the book, you tell people they need to know their numbers. What does mm-hmm. that mean? Are you checking your financial numbers every day, every week, monthly? What does that look like? And why is it important to know your numbers? I mean, once again, without knowing your numbers, money will just disappear or you don't, you can't track it, right? And once again, you can't come up with a plan. And so, you know, especially, and I say this to women, I think even more, because sometimes it's it's harder, I feel like, to, for them to even sometimes get into the numbers, right? Whether it might be somebody, if they're not the breadwinner in the family, it is so important because money can make you feel like you're trapped if you don't have enough conscious like knowledge about it, right? And so at the end of the day, you have to know what's coming in, what's going out, how are you growing your money over time? And if you don't know these things, like there are lessons online that you yeah, can learn, yeah. you know, there's tools like Mint and apps like, you know, LearnVest where you can actually put, you know, your knowledge into this, you know, and mm. really figure out how to make your money work for you, right? I think that's such an important part of it. Um, Yeah, I mean, you know, money, like I said, can be very constraining for people. And it can also be the dream, but a rich life is not money. And we just talked about that, Mm. right? It's really about waking up every day and loving what you do. Absolutely. So you want to actually be able to earn that over time. What would you say were the three best financial investments you made in the last decade? Ooh, that's hard. Well, obviously, class fast. And my time, honestly, is, is, I guess that's not a financial investment, but... To me, that was, right? Like, to yeah. me, foregoing those three years to build my company is a big one. Yeah. Um, let's see. I just recently invested in um, Olipop, which is, like, a really fun mm-hmm. fun brand yep. that I like. And I invested in one of my friends, Deepika Mutiala's new, uh, it's called Live Tinted. And it's a beauty brand about, um, you know, different skin types and different skin colors to be able to really transform what the makeup industry looks like. That's cool. That's cool. Um what else around money should we be aware of? Since you're someone who has, seems like you were very organized around money since 
corporate days and then building this company and selling this company, it seems like you've been very disciplined, mm -hmm. organized, and smart with your investments, hiring people the right way, all that stuff. What else should we know about managing or mastering money for ourselves? I think you have to be comfortable talking about it. Yes. God, I say this all the time. I think people are so afraid to just talk about money. Yeah. Why do you think people are so scared of it? I think because there's so many expectations on it. Because we think, for some reason, society has made that like a marker of success. So it becomes like this taboo thing to talk about, right? It's funny, right? Like if you think about followers, we all see that, right? It's just like a different currency, yes. right? So I think there's a little bit of that. I think people, it's complicated, right? At the end of the day, like it's a little bit complicated. You're like, wait, how do I do the math on this? Like, I don't know, but no, you know, once again, back to your earlier question, you don't need to know it every day. I think it's just a matter of having the knowledge of it and not letting yeah. it sort of, you know, run between your fingertips and get away from you to a point where you're like, how did I end up here, right? You want to be in a place where you're planning where it goes. I mean, if, especially if you're working so hard, it's so important to know where every single one of those dollars goes. And yeah. I think that goes to my other point is after talking about it, and especially I think in relationships, talk about it because I think like- Talk about can, money in relationships. Yes, because I think, you know, especially like when you get married or any of that in a family, people also have different like ways that they were raised and that they they value money differently. And I think it goes down to what does money mean to you? Mm. Like my husband loves cars and I'm like, I realize that I'm like, great. I don't really value that, but you right. value that. And like, you know, and sometimes he'll be like, cars mean the same thing to me as dance means to you. And I'm like, okay, like I, it took me a second <laughs> to like fully understand yeah. that, but I was like, it's really a passion for you, you know? And I, and I had to understand that like, that's something he loved, right? Instead of being like, wait, why are we spending money on that? <laughs> why are we spending this much money and on for him car? to be like, wait, why are you like spending money traveling around, dancing, whatever? It's a really important conversation to have, you know, because you don't, it, it, of course, like when it comes to time and stuff, people are always supportive. But when you come, when it comes down to numbers, you really need to know how it's working. And especially, I think, once again, back to the mom thing, like if you need help, right? And I think that's a very hard thing for women to ask for is help because they want to do it themselves or they don't want to spend the money. I love like delegating and outsourcing things that I feel mm -hmm. like are not fulfilling my time. Right, Especially, right. of course, you got to be in a position to do so. And I understand sure. that. And there was a time in my life where I definitely was not in a position to do that. And then there's another time in my life where I was like, okay, like how will I be able to really add the magic to the world I want to? What do I not want to be doing? Mm -hmm. Right. And whether that's asking my mom to do it, right, or a cousin to do it, you have to also learn how to make that work so people can you know come and help you and I think it's a yeah. very hard thing for people yes. to do it's very challenging so what was the conversation you had with your husband Nick around money that worked well and what conversations did not work well around money I think usually when you know someone's like wants to buy something and like you immediately like are like no we can't spend on that right I think those were the worst because mm. it's like stifling someone's dreams and you know both of us work really hard so it's like why couldn't you afford anything right I for me, it came down to, and I realized this for me, he doesn't want to track them as much as I do the money. So I realized, let me put all of this together. And I set these goals for us. Like right after we got married, I'm like, let's get all of our money. Let's get, I need all the information. If I have all the information and like set a budget, I'll feel a lot better about it. You have more peace of mind. Totally. So I'm like, you can like, you can do whatever, but I just need to know that like, I need to know where it's going and how mm. I can actually track it. Like right. at any point, you could have a lot of money or a little money. You still need to know where it's going. And so I think for me, like, it came down to having a place where we could track it. And, you know, we now, like, we have, like, a family office that helps us. Mm -hmm. And I think what's nice, and I, we, we check in with them quarterly. We go through the numbers. And I think just having that conversation, and even for him to just be like, okay, you, this is what we spent on. This is what we didn't spend on. It's good. And it's made me feel better. Just, like I said, it comes down to knowing the numbers. That's it. That, that, that's me, though. You know, like, and I think everyone needs to know what they need. But once again, the more you know the numbers, for me, it gives me the freedom to dream. And I think that's mm. what you forget is that knowing where the money yes. goes allows me to be like, okay, I have this much money to dream on, right? Like these are sort of packs I've always kind of had with my life. I'm like, okay, like I'm going to save because there's going to be something I want to spend on, right? And I agree with you. Like you don't want to live your life not living it and not enjoying it. But at the same time, you want to know where your money's going so you don't end up in a position in the future where you can't go after what you love. Right, exactly. You don't have to not have the cup of, cup of, you know, the latte or something every yeah. day if you want to go spend that $5 or yeah. go out with your friends on a weekend or something. But just know that 
every dollar that's not being saved or being invested in your potential future dream is going to take it longer to actually start it's going on. exactly and that's so if you're in a job that you might not like it's not about quitting tomorrow mm. you know actually this is it's funny even you know when i started writing this book and the, you know my husband he's like you know all these little girls always come up to me and they'll be like i'm going to quit my job I don't and, think it's a smart idea. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think it's, unless you're like, have got something on the side coming in. Right. Well, that, there you go. And, you know, and that was one of the things he's like, you know, you should make sure you tell them like the way you budget, the way you, mm. like, I'm so into every one of these details. It's, it's really risk calculation. Yes. Right. It's not taking a risk. It's about knowing, okay, I'm going to go this way. And then when I get that information, I'm going to either go this way or this way. And it's about being calculated about that. So, you know where you can keep taking more risks. And, you know, I got to the point where I could take more and more risks over time, right? Like, even when I think about my life, like, Bain to going to corporate America was, like, a little risk. I mean, I still had money coming in. It wasn't, it wasn't, like, the greatest salary, but I had money coming in, which allowed me to go and explore something, and that felt good. Mm -hmm. So I kept just doubling down on that, right? And I think that's why I always say go back to, like, just get started. Because if you don't know how to, like, even start feeling the confidence and whether it's money or identity, any of those, you just will mm-hmm. get stuck in where you are. What would you say are the three questions around money everyone should have with their partner that they're looking to get married to? Oh, those are great. Before um, you get married, what are three topics or questions around money we should have? Yeah. Um, how did your parents spend money? Ooh, okay. Right? Because so much of this, right, like my my parents, I think, you know, spent money differently than, you know, whether it's Nick or other people's parents that I know, you know, I think, and everyone's very different in this, right? And it's just, uh, it just depends on your situation, obviously, mm-hmm. and and what your income level is, right? Um, I think that is one. Two is, what are your dreams? Like, if you could have anything, like, if you were rich in the world, like, what do you want, right? I think it's like, knowing what you're dreaming towards of like the life, pretend money wasn't a constraint. What's like, the most lavish life you would want because I think it's so important to know what that is because a lavish life to someone could be like, I want to go to Bali and travel all the time. And for someone else, it could be like, I just want to work all the time and yeah. like be in my my house. I mean, one of my favorite things like with me and Nick is like we both love working. So we would travel, but we're those two people like on our computers, like working, we'll go out and then we'll keep working. <laughs> and like that works for us because, but I literally was like, wow, if I was with someone who didn't want to go back and like work or just wanted to just travel without working, like it would not work right. Just for relaxing us. all day doesn't work for you. It yeah. just doesn't. I mean, sometimes it works for me for <laughs> sure, but you know what I mean? It's like finding someone who's on yes. uh, the same way of length. And then um, third, I think it comes down to uh, knowing what parts of, I would say your expenses, either mm-hmm. um, are something that you can let go of or that you would either want to expend more on. And I know like that's a bit more of a deeper exercise, but knowing, like I said, knowing that like cars were important to Nick and then dance was, or being like, okay, like food's really important to you. But like, if you're not matched on a lot of those, like you're just going to spend in a crazy way. So it's really knowing what parts of the budget are um, important to one another. Did you guys create like a money vision together? Um, We kind of did, I would say. Like it was something that we... Early on, I think with our, once we got like, once uh, we got some like a financial planner and I think of Uh course, like either you can have a third party do this or you do this yourself. I think it's important to be like, you know, where do you want to live and when you're older, Mm -hmm. right? Like how many kids do you want to have? What kind of lifestyle do you want? And look, by the way, I, and I talk about this so much in my goal setting method, having a long-term goal is great, but like usually what you iterate and change as you go. Mm -hmm. And so while I like having pie in the sky, like dreams of what we want to do, you have to have very actionable things. Like what do you want to accomplish in the next year? And sometimes it's really just having that annual conversation. I think we do this every annually. We go through all of our numbers and we set the budget for the coming year. And I think that's a really important exercise to do in your own life or in your family life. So you both are set and you're set even in your own goals of what you want to accomplish. Something might change midway and that's okay, but at least you've set your intention in terms of money through the year. Right. A lot of people feel stuck, and I think it's because they don't set goals correctly. They don't know how to set goals. They set them, but they don't work. So what is your method around setting goals, and how can we set them correctly? Yeah, well, it's a it's a long method that I have. Give it to me. Um, so yeah, I mean, we can we can do part of it right now. Um, the first thing I always ask people to do is reflect because mm-hmm. I feel like we 
we don't remember that the last year of our lives or like the last where we are today comes from who we were. And it's so important to just kind of know what we're feeling today mm-hmm. because you need a center. Where are you starting from? And so the first step in the process is I ask everyone to always reflect, right? And mm-hmm. I do that to myself. I reflect back on what has my life been recently? What are like the words, right? Is it like anxiety? Is it balanced? Is it good stuff? Is it bad stuff? Like what are the words that keep surrounding my brain yeah. defining, you know, who, what I am today? Then I ask people to dream because mm-hmm. it's the same thing. It's about knowing what words and emotions and thoughts. And like, once again, I really like not anchoring on like accomplishments and achievements, which is like usually what we do. Like we'll be like, oh, in this last year I got a raise and I got married and blah, 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 and had a kid, like any of those. It's really just like, what did I feel in this last year? Did you feel joyful, abundant, healthy, yeah. alive? Right, yeah. right, exactly. Connected, all those things. Right, and then I and then I think the most important thing to do is to look ahead why, say, why is the feelings, first before that, why is the feelings and the energy of what you felt more important than the accomplishments? I mean, at the end of the day, that's what makes you happy, mm-hmm. right? It's not, it's not some sort of thing you checked off which right. came. It's the journey of getting there, hopefully. Mm-hmm. And um, our emotions are important to listen to, you know, especially like I think we forget how important they are to everything we do, the instincts that they give us, uh, the importance of of them in every part of who we are and ultimately it drives our happiness. We, we tend to push them aside so much, you know, especially if we talk about things like money or, you know, these practical things, we put money as, or we put emotion aside a lot, but how are they not a part of your goals and mm-hmm. checking in with who you are? When you're like, oh, here's what I want to do in the new year, if you don't check in with yourself, on where you are today, right? And if you're just measuring yourself by these big things, you have actually no idea where you're gonna, where you even wanna go as a human right. on that journey. Right. So you make decisions based on emotions? Or so first, what if you so, can't trust your emotions because they're all over the place? They're, well, yes, they're all over the place, but at the end of the day, you know what, what you know if a certain emotion was prevalent, mm. right? So it really comes down to like, did you feel happy this whole year or did you feel lonely this whole year like yes. what was like the prevalent gotcha. emotion yeah right that not was the sort moment of, to moment it's emotion. not that moment right and that's why it's really about reflecting on the whole year okay. and saying okay here's what i predominantly felt throughout the year and then um the next step is pretend yeah. it's a year from now yes and you were looking back on the year what mm-hmm. words would you have hoped you said right and i think so it's kind of doing the same exercise and what would you want to have said about your yeah. year? What, what, you know, what few words do you hope are the prevalent words going through your mind through that year? And right, so now we're not anchoring ourselves on like, I'm going to run a marathon or I'm going to get a raise. You're anchoring yourselves on like, you know, hopefully great words, you know, of I want to feel abundance and mm-hmm. I want to feel power or joy or whatever. And it could be anything, but it's about anchoring it. You know, one of the words I remember I always needed in these and it's sometimes I'm always still working on is always like this idea of home. Because I've always like been traveling and moving. So I'm like, how do I work on this idea of home without, it wasn't about buying a home, right? Which would have been the thing. It was about the feeling of home. Mm-hmm. How do you create a feeling of home? Right. And that was like a very different way to set goals for me, right? And I think this happens in relationships too. It's like very, to be like, okay, I'm going to date. I'm going to do this. And even for me, and when I first started actually doing this process, I actually met my husband, Nick, like a month really? after I did it. Which is like the craziest With thing because the process it, of what? The process of creating the life pass method. Wow. The first time I did it. Wow. That was actually when I met him. And it's because instead of being like, oh, I need to not be single and like find someone. Yeah, yeah. I changed like the word of love in my mind to being like, I want to find a long term partner. Mm. And I just like meditated on like a different idea and word in my head. It was longevity in my head. What were you thinking before that? I think I was just like, find someone like who will be there, loyalty or passion. Yeah, yeah. You know, like it was just not, it wasn't, and I remember I had the word passionate like in as my last year word. And like it was great. Like I think I was like meeting people and whatever, but like it wasn't, it wasn't a long term. Wasn't stability long term. Wasn't stability. It's stability was my other word in my, in, for my, for my coming year. And I want a longevity and, and stability. I didn't, want like passion you know or I wanted right. something I mean I want passion too but like you know in a different way you know it was like it was this interesting anchor in my head to be like wait I'm looking and I'm then therefore seeking 
the wrong things mm -hmm. in people. But I never even realized I was doing that because it wasn't a conscious thing. Because in my head, it was just date and find somebody. Right, right. So Hopefully all of this was just like, yeah, but yeah. I didn't even know what I was really like, what I wanted to put my intention into. And so, you know, after you do all the dream words, the next step of the process is actually about tracking your time, which is another whole part of the process that so many of us don't do. So look into the future. I, yep. I like, this is, I like to tell people to imagine it's New Year's Eve. Yeah. And be in the moment. In the year, and, yeah. Yeah, in a yeah. year ahead. Yep. What would you have liked to have felt and created in that past? It's the same, past right, year? exactly. So let's pretend you're a year from now, whenever that year is. So step four of the life path method is what were you saying? So step one is reflecting, step yep. two is dreaming. Dream. Um, so now we're on step three, and so this is all about focusing now. Okay. Okay. This is so step three is focus. Yeah. Step three okay. is focus, and we're gonna we start by doing a time diagnostic. So writing down all the areas that you spend any significant of time on, right? So, so your now, schedule, managing your schedule. Yes. Knowing your schedule. Knowing your schedule. Knowing your time, so yeah. it's like, what are the you know what are the tannish areas that take up most of your time in your life, right? And this could be anything from like watching TV, social media, and obviously like bigger chunks of work. Um, I think it's important to break down, right? Because sometimes it's creative work, sometimes it's administrative work. What are you really spending so much mm -hmm. of your time on? Mm -hmm. Because you need to, once again, where are you today? What are you doing? If you really want to create change in your life, you need to know what's taking up your yeah, time today. Exactly. I mean, a lot of people have, don't like, don't even know that they're like, wow, I spent hours doing nothing taking care of my pet, whatever, and not even realize how many hours I do, right? Mm. Or whatever, exactly, even nothing. But like, there is something you're doing that. Is it, is it on your phone? How many mm. hours are you spending on, like just checking emails or social mm. media, whatever it might be? Write that down because you don't know if it's serving you or not at that moment, right? I, well, I, I, I dare people to track the last 365 days of how long they were on their phone. Oh my God. It shows you like the weekly, you were on your phone like four, five, six hours a day on average this week. Screen time. Check the whole year. I bet it's a month or two of your time. Yeah. On your phone. Yeah. Throughout the year. It's a lot of time. And you're right. It's probably a month or two. It might be a month. I mean, if you're spending what? Six That's hours, a lot of you're time. You're spending, so you're I mean, spending six, hour, six hours a day or eight Adam hours a day. Adam definitely has this information for us if yeah. we want to get it. Yeah. I mean, just say you're doing 20 hours a week, which is probably more. It's probably 30, 40 hours a week in seven days. So you're doing 40 hour weeks. 52 weeks? Oh, what's the math? What is it? Sorry. 40 hours, if you're doing 40 hours a week on your phone. 40 hours times, times 52. 52. I don't know what Yeah. That is. You're at like 2,000 hours. Uh, yeah. You need a calculator or something. Yeah. 2,000 hours. How many days are we seeing? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Um, something. Yeah. I mean, let's see. 2,024. There we go. We're at like, okay, let's just say, yeah, you're at, yeah, you're close to, oh my God, we're close to, we're close to what? 10 times 10. 100 days. Three months. Yeah. Three months of your year on the phone. Yeah. Isn't that yeah, crazy? That's too much. That's way too much time. Isn't that crazy to think that's about? That's too much. Yeah. It's a little bit less than that. But yeah, it's three Even months. Even if it's two months. Yeah. And you got to think about, do I need to be on my phone this no. much? I mean, maybe if you're working and that's part of your work, then I get it. But it's like, what are those extra hours? It's it, Well, so, need to be so that's there? like what the important thing knowing is. Knowing your numbers of your schedule. Of knowing the numbers. It's just knowing what you're, what you're giving a lot of your time to, right? And so once you know that, then I think the whole part is knowing if those words are serving you or not. So yeah. the next step in the process is to actually rate those words. So giving them like a one to 10. So one means like- What type of words would you say around this? Like, um, yeah, so things like family, right? Um, health. Hobby, health, yeah, fitness. Fun, adventure, yeah. travel. Yeah, and you can be like, here's what, travel, right, exactly. I mean, mm. I fun is a bit more like, I wouldn't, because it's like not as specific. It'd be really more like working, commuting. Right. That's like mm -hmm. a great word. It's like how much time do you spend reading maybe, you know, but there's also, like I said, cooking, whatever mm -hmm. it might be, sleeping, you know, those are all the things that take up a big chunk of your time. And then the next step is to rate them. So now it's all mm -hmm. about finding out. Step four. This is step. This is actually three. step three okay. B. <laughs> rate. Rate them. Yep. I yep. love this. I love so, this approach. Yeah. So now you're thinking about does that time area serve my dream words? Yes. Right. Because that's where are you trying to get to? We already established that, right? We established the feelings and emotions you're aiming for, for the year. So you rate them on, you know, hey, like is being on my phone for X outer hours a day actually serving my time, right? And serving my dream words, right? In the future. Is doing this part of my job 
serving my dream words. And this is literally, it's not, you're not going to do anything yet. You are literally just, once again, assessing it. Assessing. Yeah. It's just knowing, right? Because once again, you, until you know, you can't make a plan, right? And mm -hmm. that's really like so much of this. And as we're even talking about it, like, I think it's about being self-aware about where you are right now to be able to get to where you, where you want to go. If you don't check in with where you mm -hmm. are right now, it's kind of impossible to know where you're going to go. Yeah, and you so, may not be able to change everything overnight, but it's like, okay, in six months I could get to this point and then I can make different changes. Absolutely. Right, okay, so that's So you rate three. them. Yep. Now becomes the fun part. Now we get to go and pick four to five areas of our life that we're gonna focus on for only the next three months. Mm. So this whole thing is a quarterly goal setting process. Yes. And the reason I do that is because three months is like a long enough time to make change. It's not a week. But it's also not a year where, it you know, you far, set, so far away. it seems yeah. so far away that you don't do anything. And it also doesn't give you enough time to change, right? So now you're, you know, you're not kind of stuck in this place where you made a commitment to yourself or a New Year's resolution. And, you know, I always think about this one, like pretend you're like, I'm going to run a marathon. And like three months in, you're like, I actually hate running. Right. What are you going to do? Like, you, know, you feel like a failure then because you mm -hmm. quit on something. So I like the idea that this is sort of quarterly and obviously like, I feel like seasons are quarterly. I mean, a lot of companies use quarterly as like a financial metric yes. and all of that. So yes. it sort of works in the world, right? And so it's a three-month goal. So you get to pick, right? So you're like, based on your ratings, you're like, okay, I'm going to focus on these areas. And I also think it's important that you pick a small amount of areas because you can't change everything at the same time. It's too much. It's too much. And I think, you know, it's so... a couple things. You can yeah. change a couple things. But if you're like, I'm going to do every single part, you're going to no. fail all of them. And then once again, this goes back to what I was saying <sighs> earlier. If you don't get started in making progress anywhere, you end up feeling like you've failed at everything. Yeah. Once again, like lowering your confidence, inability to like be yourself, take the plan A. Like it kind of all, mm. you know, goes on top of each other and makes you feel like you can't move and you're stuck. Yeah, it's hard to, I mean, it's hard to be perfect at your diet and work out three times a day and, you know, do all these things at once. Totally. So you have to choose mm -hmm. what's important to you right now based on how you're feeling. And that choice is up to you. Mm -hmm. It is actually no one else's choice. It's just hard to sometimes get there. So that's why I've designed it in a way that gets you to this place of being like, okay, like based on how I'm feeling, based on how I spend my time, based on how these areas are serving me, I am going to now choose these four to five areas to go after. And then you set mini goals mm -hmm. that are very measurable and actionable in all of them. So then I go down and my whole thing is like, don't pick number, don't say things like more or less. You have to be very specific. Like I'm going to eat three healthy meals a week, you know, or um, write for 30 minutes. You know, it has to be very specific. If they're not measurable, there are things that you're never going to know that you did or not. And I right. think it's, you know, and in the book, I take people through like each of these advice tips that I have, because I think you also forget to think about the how you always kind of get stuck on like the end game of where you want to go. Like, mm -hmm. okay, I want to like become a chef. It's like, great. Where are you going to start? You know, where do you need to go grocery shopping? Do you need yeah. to look at recipes? I want to learn tennis. It's the step like sometimes in a quarter might just even be find an instructor. It's not even about like becoming a tennis player, or even playing tennis. Sometimes the hardest part is just even finding yes. where you're going to go. And mm -hmm. it's okay if in your three months, all you did was find the person you're going to end up going to class with the right. next month, right? right? Or the next three quarter period. But that's the whole thing is it's about just making progress towards where you want to go instead of not getting started at all. Mm -hmm. What's the next step? Yeah. So now once you've picked the areas, you start setting goals. Yes. So you'll end up with four to five, you know, four to five areas. Mm -hmm. We should have just done your life. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This is very similar to how I approach it because I, um, as an athlete, you know, we would be, I would go into the football practice. I remember when I first started playing football, so I was a sophomore in high school. And what I noticed right away in the locker is each one of us in our lockers, mm -hmm. when we're getting our pads on and getting ready for the practice, had a piece of paper which was the exact schedule and timestamps of what we were doing that day for practice. Yeah, there you go. So we knew exactly on the minute what we we're going to be doing to prepare us for the week's goal. Yep. And for the seasonal goal. So you everything I do is based on a season as well. Yeah. Called quarterly Love that. seasonal because sports are a season. Totally. And um, you know, I I'm obsessed by my schedule Same. and scheduling <laughs> in the most important things first, and then working around that. Yep. Not vice versa, and putting like. The things that are important last. Yeah. Doing them first. And I think that's what's really important. You know, for me, Spanish is really important to learn right now. So I'm scheduling it every day. And yes. I usually do the hard things in the morning. Totally. I love Wor that. <laughs> working out is something important. So I schedule them. I yep. did it this morning at 730. And those are things that you sometimes like 
can let go if like other things end up becoming more important. More important absolutely. But if you are like, no, I have to do this. It's mm -hmm. this isn't up to somebody else. Like no. people know, like I work out every single day. It, it's not an optional thing. This isn't a oh because I have time. It's like no, no, no. This is a part this of is the, the most work thing, yeah. for pile. <laughs> like yeah. this is my work. You know, a part of my day. It's not going to change. Right, right. And I think it's you're the only person who can make that pack with yourself. Exactly. And that's why I think I love that you're talking about the time and knowing your time and your schedule because for me it's schedule is everything yeah and tracking your schedule yep uh, and seeing it so you talk about start setting so now goals. we're gonna yeah so now within each focus area that we have so you end up with like four to five focus areas um you set mini goals right so there's like let's say you set three goals really tight goals within each so as i was saying it might be i want to take up tennis right mm -hmm. so it literally might be let's go and you know research Three ten, find three three right, instructors right. online, read about them, look up the prices, mm. sign up for a class. Yeah, it's so simple, but like honestly, most people would probably be like, "I've wanted to play tennis for years and never do any part of the process." Right. Even if you ended up in three months with just some like a first class that you signed up with, something. that is progress. Yeah, it's something. Right, you know, and I think people forget to think of it that way, and that's why it's really important, right? It could be like, "I want to write a screenplay." Okay, great. Where are you going to get started? It might be, "Hey, like I'm going to go." be inspired and read three other screenplays. And like like I said, back to numbers. It's like read yes. three, write for 30 minutes every other day. You know, I, it's about being very specific on it, right? Write 10 pages. Mm -hmm. And then you actually feel like you can check something off, which yes. we all like to do. Pro see progress. See progress. But you're also not like setting yourself up to never do it, right? Because in those 10 pages, you're going to learn so much about yourself. Yes. Right? But writing nothing, you're never going to get there. And writing... 100 pages probably feels too daunting. Too much. Right. Yeah. So now you're giving yourself something really, really concrete to do. Okay. And the next step? So then that's it. So it takes, now you go through and you go through writing all the steps. And at the end, you have a whole plan. You have a whole plan. You have 10 to 15 goals. For the next To quarter. go after for the next three months. Yeah. Bite-sized goals. And sometimes like the goals will feel really small. Like it'll be like cook dinner three times. Right, right. They feel small, right? And like they're not crazy audacious like goals that we might be used to. But those are the important little bite-sized goals that actually build huge things. Like yeah. whenever I even think of class pass, like I said, I was telling you like it was a dance class. It was like getting good in one dance class that taught me the skills and the tool set, right, to really get to being a great entrepreneur. Mm. And it was like every day at the office that taught me to be a better leader the next day. So it's not, I set out my dream to build a class fest. I set out to solve a problem, but it was the lessons along the way and the little goals that actually allowed me to take bigger and bigger steps, right, yeah. when you get it. What are three of the biggest lessons you learned from dance that helped you become a great entrepreneur? Uh, I think the first one is discipline, just knowing that when my teacher is like, this is the way you do a step and I can't get it, it's about figuring out how I'm going to keep practicing to keep getting to the place where I can, you yeah. know, I can actually get to that, get to that point. Uh, to teamwork. I think when you dance with a group of girls and, you know, we always perform as a group and like every formation had to be super tight. It was really about knowing how do you, how do you work with people? Right? How do you transform together? How do you make sure that you bring people up with you when they might not be at the same level and, yeah. and a lot of that? And I think the third one, I think for me specifically, came back down to learning about where I came from, especially Indian dance. I think I didn't know enough about my roots. And I think this also once again helped my identity flourish for mm. me, was learning just the beauty of like the women I come from in India. Nice. And I think that's been like such an important journey for me. And I think for anyone who like plays a sport, or whatever, like you get a lot of that from just do, you learn so much about yourself right. when you put in effort and energy and learn about, you know, the essence of something that you're doing. Yeah. Let's go back to identity. What, how do you shape your identity now? What do you think about when you think about yourself? in terms of identity. Yeah. Um, and how can identity really support your growth versus how could it hurt you? Yeah, I mean, like I said, you either split yourself into minutia of you know different parts of who you are, because let's be honest, the world wants to label you. It's just easier for people to understand things, right? I mean, you're like in the content world, like, you mm. know, it's just easier, right, for yeah. things to be clear. Yes. So people want to naturally label you. 
And should we be labeling ourselves? No, because Why none not? of us fit in a box. Mm. We're all different. So how do you shape your identity then? When you when you talk about your personal identity, what do you say to Even yourself? Even for myself? Yeah. I mean, it's hard. I mean, it's like, you know, when we were, you know, we were talking <laughs> about this, like, I will always, I like to be known for the work I've done, obviously. Like, I think work that's especially timeless, like, to me, like, that is, like, something. And I, I try and want to define myself personally by the work I do. And, like, I have this thing, I'm like, create timeless things. Like, that is really what to me, my identity is, if I think about it like holistically, mm. whether it's a child to, <laughs> you know, a company or, you know, art, create timeless things. But it's still hard, right? We want to, it's easier for people to be like, oh, she's an entrepreneur, she's a woman, she's a mom, she's a wife, right? Like it's it's very easy to do that. And and look, that, that helps us because in a way it gives us a community, right? It gives us sort of that, that place to go. I think the important thing is not to get stuck in that and not to close our minds mm -hmm. when we're in that world, right? So even like I was in like sort of the MIT business world and I was so lucky that I had a creative world that from dance that was so different than my day to day that inspired me to be like, wait, people like classes, obviously, you know, and other things with their life and time. Or I would have sort of been stuck in the same exact thoughts and process that I was surrounded with. And I think we forget that is that we're, we are allowed to grab from different types mm -hmm. of our identity, right? So even like for me, when I talk about my dance identity or my Indian identity, I'm allowed to grab from that and my American identity. I cheerleaded for 10 years. Like it's like a very big part of me too. It's how do I become, I'm, I'm a South Asian American. Mm -hmm. I'm not Indian and I'm not American. I am a combination of the wow. two, right? And I think it's about letting those things flourish. And I'm not just a businesswoman and I'm not just a creative. I'm combined both. And all of those parts made me the person I am and also made me apt to be solving the problem I did, mm -hmm. right? And I think that's how you have to think about it is all these pieces of us are going to come together to help us conquer whatever problem yes. that we are meant to solve in the world. And it's about pulling from all of it versus shutting any one of them down because yeah. we feel uncomfortable. And right. sometimes it's, like I said, it's about embracing the community it's about learning from the art of the roots of something that you came from, even though we sometimes don't want to, right? We want to like, we want to put it aside, but you will be more proud of it as you get older. Even when I was growing up and I was learning some of these Indian like folk dances, I didn't like them. I wanted to do more of like the hip hop or, the, yeah, yeah, or like Bollywood or at the my, time or yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, gotcha. Hip hop, jazz, Bollywood. But now looking back, I'm like, I love those, you mm. know, I love those more in a way because they gave me such a depth to who I was, which like at the time when I was young, I was like, I don't want to do this. This is boring. Or yeah, this is you know, whatever, so yeah. so it's it's one of those things where I think you you learn to appreciate it over time too. And I think a lot of people do that as they get older. You're like, oh yeah, like I used to do that when I was younger because so much of our identity once again is shaped when we're, when we're younger. But at the end of the day, it's about not getting stuck and not letting anything define you. And, you know, actually so much of this goal setting process of what I love is you can totally change who you are every three months. Mm -hmm. You can set a whole new group of goals. So right. you don't have to get stuck in the life you are living and like the dreams that you have. You are allowed to try something new. You could be an author, right? You can be an actress if you want. And you might like it or not like it, but you, who, you're the only one who should choose that. Yeah. And you should try it, go for it, and say no if it's not for you. Yeah. We were talking about this before about how... Um... You know, when I interview like these gold medalists who are like win the Olympics gold at like 16 and they realize that's probably the biggest moment I'll, I'll ever have, mm -hmm. right? Like winning gold medal in front of a world platform of a billion people oh watching. God. Yeah, how do you, how, how do, do you, I recreate do that? that feeling of <laughs> yeah. a gold medal ever again? Um, Liz Gilbert talks about this from her book, You Pray Love, where she's like, you know, it was probably like one of the biggest books I'll ever do. Maybe I'll be able to recreate that. Yeah. But how am I going to sell 10 million books in like two years ever again? You know, right. whatever it might be. How have you been able to shape your identity now after selling ClassPass for a massive amount, this being your baby for a decade? Where does your identity go now? Um, it goes back to the root of who I am. And I think... It's funny, especially writing this book during this this time. I actually have had so many times where I'm like, wow, I feel like I hear I am the same 
same person like a decade ago, mm-hmm. right? And going through so many of the same things. And there was a point where I was like, wow, I feel split. Like my identity is in my corporate job. Yeah, yeah, do I want to yeah. build a company? What do I want to want to do? I didn't know I was going to be an entrepreneur, mm-hmm. but I knew I had to seek out that inspiration and seek out a lot of it. And I think I'm right back there. I'm at this part in my life where I need to go back to what drives me. What do I love to do? Who am I? Ask myself some of those really hard questions, which, you know, are obviously easier to say sometimes, <laughs> but absolutely. Like I've realized like I need to do the work on myself again. Like so much has happened yes. to me. Right. And I think as much as, you know, I was and when I was starting the company, it's it, this is like the book and I talk about this so much is like I was very in control of things. When you build something massive, like a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff happens to you as well. Right. It just it just naturally does because of the immensity of what you built. And so much of like this process is like, how do I hang on to the things that I love and want to do? So there's like a sadness, obviously, in it. It's a very bittersweet moment. But at the same time, I'm also so ready to go and kind of do this work and map out this next decade of my life because I know there is so much more. But I'm going back to dance because that's what I love. And I feel like it just grounds me and in like my calling, it makes me feel like I can, that's my first place where I know I can like feel like I have impact and like just the world. And I know there's, there's more ahead, but I have to kind of go back to that. Yeah. Have you reflected on the past year yet? On the past year? Yeah, I actually was, I was just doing it. I mean, here's the thing. I became a mom during COVID, which was not easy. Mm. So, you know, these last few years have been tough, you know, it's just like one of those things I think this past year for me was like, a lot of celebration, but there was like loneliness too, because you're, you know, I have a kid and like some of my, my family can't come and see him yeah. and things like that. So, so like, like you said, like there's good words and bad words, you know, that are not, I don't even like to say good and bad, but it's really just different types of emotions sure. that are always there. And so I'm like, how do I take those things and set them for the coming year? Have you started dreaming yet? Or are you still kind of in reflection mode? I'm, I'm a little bit in, in a bit of both, I yeah. would say. Like, I'm, I feel like I like to do it like right when the year is ending. So like during uh-huh. that winter break is like the best time to dream. I mean, I'm always dreaming, but I think my dreams for the coming year they're less specific in the sense of like, oh, I'm going to go and do this. And because I'm, I think a lot of it even comes down to doing the work on myself. Like I'm, you know, after, after this book comes out and all that, I'm like, I want to, I know I need to do work on myself and that might require like a creative retreat and like Mm. time with myself, which is sometimes so hard to find, but I really need to do it because I can't cure myself sometimes in the, in the craziness of chaos of day to day. Yeah, exactly. Change your pace, you know, change, try something new. And Mm. I know I need to do that. You know, I, I talk a lot about that too. It's it's one of those things where when people don't know what their calling is, you sometimes just have to put yourself in different environments, yes. right? And it's usually within you already. So that's why like it's a combination of the two for me where I need to clear the noise so I can hear myself mm-hmm. and then also try new things to allow myself to see how I feel while I'm doing that, right? It's like you saying like, I don't want to be a truck driver. It's like right. you just have to sometimes put yourself in different situations to be like, am I enjoying how my identity feels in this, in this, right? Does this feel right or wrong? And I have to be careful. And I think we all do is, you know, I don't want to ever be in a place where I'm like, oh, do I need to create class pass again? That's not what, you know, that's not what's going to be amazing. What does that even mean? Right? Like creating another company like that. It, to me, it was always about the impact on people's lives. Do I want to continue to impact people's lives? Absolutely. Will I? I know I will. Will it be a few hundred people? Will it be billions of people? I don't know yet, but that's the journey I'll go on as I go. There's a lot of people that are inspired by you, a lot of women that look up to you as well, and they see you with the results you've created with this, you know, impactful company that's helped a lot of people around the world. They see you as a mom, you know, as a, as a wife. They see you with, you know, healthy, young, all these different things. Do you have any insecurities still? Do I have any insecurities? And if so, Ooh. how are you navigating those? Because you seem extremely comfortable in your own skin and confident and you know what you want and you're accomplished. Is there anything that you struggle with? I mean, I think this is probably one of the hardest times in my life because I don't have an exact answer of what I'm working on. And I Mm. think my life has been defined by my work, you know, whether it's dance or class pass for a very long time. And honestly, like, even right now, like, I'm questioning everything. Like, where really? do I want to live? Yeah, absolutely. Like, I don't know. My husband knows this, obviously, too. But, like, I'm like, do we want to be on the East Coast, West Coast? Like, you know, and I've realized that I'm like, I'm okay with throwing everything out the door 
to rebuild because this is an opportunity too. And even though like it's really hard though, like to kind of wake up and not know every day, like I'm going to have this meeting and do this and where it's going to lead uh, because I'm so used to having a little bit of that structure structure in my life. Yes. Uh, but that's really hard. And I think, you know, and as much as um, mm. it's as much as it's like an honor to be this like figure for, for you know, especially young women, it's also a lot of pressure, you know, and I think when you have to make decisions like in the spotlight in any way and there's like only a few of you doing it, it's a lot of pressure, right? And you want to make sure you continue to inspire, but you also need to be authentic to yourself, you know? And I think even for me, like, there was a long time, this is going to sound strange, but, like, I thought I couldn't dance because I thought the tech world would judge me, mm. you know? And it was a really weird time for me because I felt I had to be somebody for, like, the girl boss tech world. And inside, I was this, like, artistic human being, too, and I had to hide her for a little bit. Wow. So I got trapped in that like many times. And and that's kind of, you know, the stuff I'm even working through now is, wow, like when did all this happen to me? You know, and it comes down to everything where society almost starts putting a lot of stuff on you. I think anytime you start, you know, you build something big, it's the world starts trying to tell you who to be and how to define yourself and how do you continue to make sure you're centered yeah. in all that you do. And yeah, I mean, I have to go back to that all the time and and really remember that I'm allowed to be me in all these environments. And I still am the daughter of, you know, immigrant parents who have like expectations and things like that, whether it's like being a mom or a wife and you have to really work through a lot of that. Yeah. I, I believe that there are three main fears that most of us have. The fear of failure, mm -hmm. the things that hold us back from mm -hmm. actually going after what we want. The fear of failure being one, the fear of success. You were talking about kind of the pressure, the yeah. weight of success yeah. that some people have, which what which makes them not go after what they want. Sure. Because they're afraid of that responsibility. Yeah. And the fear of judgment of other people or, or other people judging you mm -hmm. and their opinions. Which one of those three fears do you feel like was is is the hardest for you to overcome? Fear of failure, fear of success, or fear of judgment? Probably fear of judgment, I would say. I think I've worked my way through mm -hmm. fear of failure by failing many times in a way. And honestly, I'm like just not scared. It's so funny. Like if something happens with the company or anything, you're like, okay, what do you do? Like I just yes. know how to how to how to deal with that? And in your book, you said failure is a data point, not Absolutely. an end point. Exactly. Which I always say, failure is feedback. It's yeah. just information. Same thing. It's information to help to you know get to when, success. So I'm yeah. not, I'm not really scared of failure anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's hard to do it when you're like more public, obviously, yeah. you know. Um, but I've learned to kind of work through that, and I, you know, I, I that one is hard. Fear of success is also, yeah. I mean, there's the responsibility thing, but I, uh, for me, like the way I've always been able to kind of when I go back to my why, there, I'm like, it's. I'm doing things for the right reason, and so it's success no matter what. Mm -hmm. So I feel like I get there. But I think fear of judgment, and I have I feel like I've built a really good toolkit. Like I said, like I know how to set boundaries, mm -hmm. um, whether it's even like like I have a, a block on my social media, like in terms of time, all of that. Like I feel like I know how to control my thoughts and stuff. But at the same time, it creeps in, you know, oh. and you really, that's kind of what, like the cleanse you sometimes need to do is that. And, and it really comes down to <laughs> what type of cleanse, cleansing of people, cleansing of, yeah. of social media, like mm -hmm. just cleansing of the things that trigger your mind into the same sort of thought patterns. And, I, you know, sometimes it's like hanging out with completely new people is sometimes the best thing you could do who don't know you, right. Or yes. who aren't putting in any type of expectation on you. When you hang out with like same people who are in a certain industry or a certain like type of friend group, you don't realize that you are absorbing their expectations. And I've always loved having like, like I said, I have always had a very varied group of friends, like super businessy ones, super creative ones, you know, like just all in different fields. And I love that yeah. because I absorb from everyone to be able to like kind of become who I am. And sometimes like you really need to change. I actually think the reason like going back to even what's hard right now is COVID's been really hard. Because we haven't been able to do that. And I think, like, I'm one of those people who absorbs energy from people and, like, who I'm around my surroundings. Mm -hmm. It's, like, that empathy and that feeling. I create my art that way. I feel like I create products that way. And it's been hard to just not live, you know, and see people and to absorb that energy yeah. that kind of gives you that, like, extra 
pep in your step. You know, I think right. that's been an interesting and challenging time. But yeah. Has there are there any other fears that you feel like have you've struggled with or have held you back? I mean, through my life. Um, that are maybe not in one of those categories. Yeah, you know, I think um, you always feel like, are you good enough? You know, yeah. I I think like. I know I don't ever feel like, oh, have I done enough any of that? But I think it's just like there's always like, you know, when I was pitching investors, you know, once again, I'd be like, am I smart enough? And it's like, I went to MIT. Am I smart enough? But you still are like, I'm a woman. Am I smart uh, enough to people in the room? I'm I'm 4'11". I'm this like small human being compared to everyone <laughs> right. in that room. Are they going to respect me mm. as much as they would respect somebody else? You know, but I have always learned to just if I do good work that will always shine through. And I think I stuck to that mantra through this whole thing because nice. there was a lot of people who said no to me. You know, Did I ever think it wasn't going to work? No, because I knew I was just going to... Figure it out. I was yeah. going to just fight You know, because I cared so deeply about it. But it was hard when you're in these situations where people either doubt you, don't understand you, can't see it, right? And you have to just kind of get back up and fight the next day. How do you... Learn to not doubt yourself when you go through a struggle or a challenge. What is your toolkit or strategies to believing in yourself when other people are saying no to you? Um, I, so first of all, always go back to like the deep why, right, yeah. that you have. I think like for me, I was set, uh, setting out to once again like give dance and this feeling of great like greatness to so many people. Going back to that like just spark you and kind of get you back up. The doubt is about controlling your mind, right? Mm -hmm. It's about controlling your thoughts. Um, a lot of times, like I said, I think, you know, and I, I talk, I go through this also in depth with like this, this situation with my mom where she really wanted me to obviously like get married and all of that. And I get it, right? And I understand that from her perspective. And it just was something that I was like, I was focusing on different things in my mm -hmm. life. But, you know, something I did, and I remember a lot during that the process when I was building Class Fest, and there was so much... Good stuff happening and bad stuff happening at the same time. Every morning I would I would share a quote. And this was like actually before like there was like Instagram and stuff. So this is just Facebook. And I would share a quote every morning. And the reason I did it is because it forced me to wake up in the morning. The first thing I did was like go and scroll quotes. What a great way to start with like a positive thought. And then I would post the quote, which like automatically it comes back to you sort of like during the day because people are commenting mm -hmm. on it or whatever it might be. And I think it was a lot of just changing my mindset to that positive thought constantly. So when the doubt was there, when either, like I said, I would set boundaries and be like, I'm not going there with you. And if it sometimes means like not seeing certain people, you have to do that. Mm -hmm. And then on the other end is controlling your thoughts with what do you want to think about, right? So the to me, like the antithesis to doubt is positivity, Right. And it's like, I'm not going to listen to that. I'm going to focus on the positive, not the negative of the situation. So that person might be like, oh, I don't think there's a market here. I'm going to be like, I'm going to, there is a market here. I'm going to class right now and I'm going to go. Right. And so I think it's one of those things. It's about focusing on the positive and pushing through it and letting the, letting the negative go, mm -hmm. go away. And, you know, to me, like, this is about life too. I talk a lot about this too. Like, a life of yes is so much better than a life of no. And right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and when you have so much good stuff to say yes to, there's you don't even have time to say no. Right. Like th there comes a point where you're just like, I'm just doing everything in my life that I love. Like, I, I, I don't even have time to say no. And like, it's so obvious instead of that guilt you might feel to be like, I have to miss this. You don't even have time for it because yeah. th the yes is so obvious. And so like so much of this and even in the life Pass method, it's about designing it. So like the yes is so obvious. You don't have to question it. You don't have to feel like you need to even do the obligations because your list of stuff you have to do trumps everything. Right. Yeah. You know, and you believe in it. And that's the mentality everyone really needs to live by. And it's because if you take care of yourself, you're serving the human race. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think that's the part people don't always get. Like, I, I think about it. I'm like, imagine if the years I was building ClassPass, I was focused on all the things like I was guilty, like I felt guilty about and obliged about. And and I did probably feel selfish during that time. To be very honest, I felt selfish because I had to focus on my stuff. But I wasn't focusing on me. I was focusing on building this company. Mm -hmm. This company would not exist and have changed the people's lives it did if 
I wasn't quote unquote selfish, right? right. And I hate using that word because it's not selfish. What I was doing was taking care of myself so I could be in service of other people. Yes. I know that's a very weird way of thinking about it, but that's how I always thought about it. And honestly, we all should design our lives that way. We are taking care of ourselves so we can take care of others, Absolutely. whether that be our family, our friends. If you're not the best version of you and doing the things that are truly pulling you forward in your life, you are not showing up as a great mm -hmm. person to everyone else and giving what you are meant to be. Yeah. And I think we forget to think of it that way. And we think giving is a very transactional thing of like, oh, yeah, like I showed up here and I gave you my time. Right. It's are you giving them the best version of you in that time? Like the happiest version of, you know, or like the best version you could be. Mm -hmm. I love that. How has the best version of you come out since you had your son? Oh my God, it's so amazing watching a kid grow up and like a baby <laughs> grow. Um, and what is, what's the biggest lesson you've learned about being a mom in the last year and a half? Um, it's much harder than I thought. <laughs> I will be honest. You know, I think nothing prepares you for for motherhood. It's it's like having a startup again in a way, you know, but right. it's a 24-7 job, right? And um, I think as an ambitious woman too, like just realizing what that is, is is hard and how, you know, you you want need to still prioritize your own time and your own goals and ask for help when you need. Like I very much, I used to always do that and, and like be careful on my time. I became even like more thoughtful about it really? because you just have to know exactly, you know, what hours you have. Like, and sometimes that, it's not as pre predictable with the kid. That's the hard thing. It's like I was used to having a predictable schedule. You have to be more flexible. You now. have to be more flexible. Absolutely. But, you know, you make it work. And, you know, but there's nothing like, the joy of seeing this thing you create, like just start growing up in the world. I mean, he just started talking and singing and it's amazing to know that, you know, you're there to guide their life. Like, I think it's like, it's interesting when you're a parent, it's made me reflect a lot on like what my role is in his mm -hmm. life. And like this word parent, right, is such an interesting word. But like my job is to guide him towards his fulfillment in life, right? And I really think it's about thinking about that. And there are times where I've caught myself like wanting him to do things like, oh, he needs to talk. He needs to walk, like going into like the type A-ness that I want to. And I'm like, no, I need to enjoy <laughs> this time. He needs to be reading faster than any <laughs> kid and be at MIT now. <laughs> you know, but it happens to all of us, right? And you compare yourselves and you look at other kids and you're like, oh, wait, should my kid be doing that? And I've learned to just be like, he is on his own journey and I'm here to support him and raise him in the best way environment I can. And what I want to just give him is a lot of love. That's like the number one thing. That's what we need the most. Yeah. Oh, man. I'm excited about this book and these uh, strategies for people. It's called Life Pass, a groundbreaking approach to goal setting. Drop, yep. drop your limits, rise to your potential. And um, this will be out right when we drop this, this episode. So I want to make sure that everyone gets a copy and and gets a few copies for your friends as well. Because I think people get confused around goal setting and how to do this for themselves. And you really break it down for us and share some amazing stories. And uh, and again, talking about identity. I love that you talk about identity right away. I'm actually working on a book right now. And I think identity plays a big part in our wow, lives. Yeah. Um, so there's so many great examples and lessons in here. And I think, again, I, I love the part where you said failure is a data point, not an end point. I think so many people are afraid to fail as opposed to seeing it as information as a data point, feedback, whatever you want to call it, right. to give you the tools now and what you need to grow into to accomplish what you want. So, so much good stuff in here. Um, so make sure you guys get a few copies, yes. share with your friends, post about it. And you should do the goal setting together. It's do, always fun to the, have somebody that... Yes, find someone to do the accountability with you in the goal setting. Exactly. And leave a comment on this video or um, wherever you're listening to this, make sure to leave a comment of the part of this interview you enjoy the most. I want to ask you a couple final questions. Of course. This is called the three truths question. Oh, boy. So I'd like you to imagine okay. a hypothetical scenario. All right. You live as long as you want, but it's your last day on Earth. So you get to live as long as you want to live. Where am I going after this? I'm really into astrophysics. So. You're, you're going wherever <laughs> like, you want where to go. I going? Wherever you go after is what you want to do. <laughs> Whatever you believe in. But it's your last day on Earth. Okay. And you've accomplished all of your dreams and everything you want to do in life, you've made come true. Um, but for whatever reason, you've got to take all of your work with you to the next place. All of your messages, your content, the book, anything that's out there, we don't have access to your information anymore. Okay. 
but you get to leave behind three things you know to be true from all of your life experiences. Like three messages? or Three lessons Ooh. that you would share with the world. And this is all we have to remember you or your content by. Okay. What would you oh, say are those three truths that you would share with the world? Oh, wow. First, I would probably leave some Indian music behind because okay. <laughs> I really love Indian music and it's the most meditative, amazing thing in the world. And I feel like there's so many parts of my life I, I listen to it, whether it's like Kirtan or or Garba, which is like a type of Gujarati folk dance, and I feel like it calms me, and I just feel like it should never be lost, and okay. the world will get so much from it because it's timeless. What lesson would that be if you had to leave a lesson behind? Um, let's see. What's like the lesson from the music? I think it's about listening to your soul. Mm, oh, that's good. Okay. Um, Truth number two. The only thing constant is change. To mm -hmm. so learn to be flexible and adaptable. Okay. Three. You are unique and no one in the world is made up in the same way you are. So live your life on your own path. Yeah. Those are beautiful. I love those. I want to... Uh... I want to acknowledge you for a moment for the incredible journey you've been on. Oh, Again, I think it's, I think growing up with, I, mean, I didn't grow up with immigrant parents, but for someone who did, yeah. I know how challenging that is yeah. to go chart your own path and your own destiny yeah. against the uh, norms of what your parents want or mm -hmm. your, your culture wants for you from relationship at a certain time, career, <laughs> school, all these different things. Yeah. And going against what your friends might think or comparing you or what thinking you're going off some crazy dream or whatever it is and living your truth around dance and around being an entrepreneur to solve problems i think it's really inspiring that yep. you did what your soul you listened to your soul and you went after it yep. even when it wasn't popular yep. even when people you know thought you were a little weird in the tech world. <laughs> yeah, corporate world tech world you never did fit these in things. <laughs> you didn't fit in and i think that's a really inspiring that not that we always need to break the mold or something, but you did what you felt like your soul was telling you to do. Yeah. You listened to it and you leaned into it. And I think that's really so inspiring to, to hear that story and then know that's what you've been on and you're still doing it. So I think that's really cool. I also want to acknowledge you for uh, creating something that is mission-based and not self-based. Yeah. But thinking, how can I solve this problem for me, but hopefully for others as well. And for now, learning these lessons, sharing with the world with your book. So Thank I really you. acknowledge you for... Thanks. You don't have to make this book. You've made a ton of money. You don't have to work any ever again if you don't want to. So the fact that you're actually sharing your wisdom and knowledge with people who might be struggling, I think, is a really powerful and inspiring thing. So I really acknowledge you for you. showing up every day yeah. uh, on your journey as you reinvent yourself and your identity and yeah. your goals and all this stuff. Um, how can we be of best service to you besides getting a copy of the book? Where can we go to follow you and find you? Yeah, I'm on Instagram. I'm at Pyle. So P-A-Y-A-L, not yeah. PayPal, yeah, as yeah. we were talking about earlier. At Pyle. Um, I'm yeah. at Pyle on Instagram. You can follow me there. I, I share my dance journey there as I well as I love the videos over there. Quotes. Yeah. yeah, I mean, um, you know, like you said, I'm just living my life as a person and a soul on this earth. And I just want to keep creating timeless things, as I said. You know, I think that's really it. It's about living a life that I love and not letting anything hold me back. Mm. And that's what I want for the world through my book. Inspiring. Okay. Final question. What's your definition of greatness? Oof. Oh, God. Okay, hold on. Definition of greatness. It's doing what you love so well and not caring about what anyone else thinks. Why is it such a taboo topic in general? Yes. I think for all classes, all individuals. I it's totally like, agree. It's like you have, it's so funny because, and I wrote about this in my book, like for women, we have shame if we don't have enough money, but we also have shame if we have quote unquote too much. Really? Yes. Why? Because it's like, you know, 